Well, good evening, everybody. It's Wednesday. Actually, it's Tuesday night. I've been doing this all day long. Um, we were here. We've been prepping for tonight, and we don't know what to do because we're creatures of habit. And so my brain has been telling myself all day it's Wednesday. And we've got an extra day this week because it's not Wednesday, it's Tuesday. So good to see each of you on a Tuesday night and glad to have those that are tuning in and watching, uh, not able to be with us tonight. We miss you. Some of you are traveling, but we're so glad to have each of you that are either here or able to tune in with us. So we're going to do some things a little different tonight, and I hope different's okay. It is uh, meant to be a Thanksgiving praise service, and so we're going to give God praise, of course, because he gets all the credit. But I want to invite you to Psalm 86, and then we're going to jump into some things where we'll have some participation, okay? Psalm 86. So some of these psalms, if you understand much about this, and trust me, I'm not going to pretend like I know everything that David was thinking or the other psalm writers, but in psalms, some of them were basically meant to be sung. Some are prayers, and that's what we're seeing actually in Psalm 86. There's some others, and it's based on composition, and this one has a little bit of, I guess, irregularity as far as the way it was composed, which typically is typical of... Um, those that are uh, put together as prayers. And so if you want to reference some similarities and you like to get into all the deep stuff on that, Psalm 17, Psalm 90, Psalm 102, Psalm 142, all are uh, prayerful psalms of David. Um, and so you can see some of the similarities. This is a psalm of David. It's um, um, very clear by the the writing and the time and everything that goes with it. But we're not talking about David tonight. David's just a part of the message. Uh, we're talking about God. And I want to talk to you about what it looks like to tell God, thank you, Lord. We used to sing the song. Remember, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. You know, um, well, this is a prayer that gives God the utmost. And so, if you'd like to, and I'd invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word, Psalm 86, verses 8, 9, and 10. Here's what God's word says, and then we'll get into some of the deeper uh, conversation. And it's interesting because this verse clearly stands out when you read it like, wait, David just said that? Context, okay? And I'll give you context momentarily. Verse 8, among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name, for thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. You may be seated. I love the way God is just front and center. God gets the full spotlight, as he should all the time when we look into his word. But I'm just going to give you two simple points tonight and let you kind of help me on the third, if you will. The first thing I want you to see tonight as we say thank you, Lord, is I want you to see the greatness of God. God is not just okay. God is not just a little bit of this or a little bit of that. When you consider the tier that God sits on, there's no one even close. Remember we talked the other day about God had made us a little lower than the angels. And I said, we may be second, but there's a big gap between number one and number two. And so we see the greatness of God. And I want you to see three words that just jump off the pages of the word tonight. The first one in verse eight is God among. God among. So we, we just in case there's a person out there, okay, that wants to be combative, and they say, you know what? I know you say your Jehovah God's awesome, but I'm thinking about my God. And so David says, okay. And you and I are probably looking at this, at least it's the way I did. And I saw where it said amongst the, like, like it was almost like David was saying, wait, what? Are you all of a sudden what we would call polytheistic? Have you forgot that there is only one God? Well, of course that's not the case. But he's giving lent to argument. And a lot of times, I'll just give you a little tip here, okay? So you run into somebody that doesn't want to be a believer, and they don't claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, you could do the, the blatant thing, and you can say, 
I don't care what you think. God's God, and they're not coming. I can tell you that right now. That's not the way you want to approach that conversation. If you go in combative, you're going to lose the person. It doesn't work that way. But if you'll go in, and I, I tried to do what David's doing here. I'm not, because I'm smart, I'm doing what the Bible shows us. But if you'll say, so where do you come from on this? So you believe this, this, and this. Okay. So I try to give people an opportunity to share. After all, that's what we want, don't we? We want the courtesy. So where do you come from on this? Oh, so you think it's okay for this, or you think this is a real God? Okay. Well, you're saying this, but let me show you why God's God. And that's exactly what David's doing. David's clearly making him known that, hey, look, while you may think that there's other lowercase gods, he's going to assert in this specific psalm, and as you look at his writings, there's no question that David only believes in one true God. But he says, among the gods. So David's acknowledging not that gods really exist, but that he dwells among people who believe they do, and so he gives them an understanding, and that's what he's trying to do here, okay? So I don't ignore the fact that there's people of other cults outside of Christianity. Um, I mean, we know they're real. We just don't ascertain to their beliefs, and that's what David's doing here, okay? So he says, among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Of course, he's not speaking to these other people. He's, he's praying to God. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. So he gives credit where credit is, belongs. The, understand, while we sit around and we think about all the great things in life, let's remember the Father of lights who brings all these down, as the word teaches. It's God who brings in all these wonderful things, and we'll talk a little bit about that momentarily. So David doesn't believe in God's, okay, in a sense of faith, any more than, remember Moses? Back in Exodus, the plagues. You know what's one of the great stories about the plagues, if you don't know this? Uh, it was so cool the way God did this. So when we know the plagues, and one of the worst ones that really attacked their religious center, as far as the Egyptians were concerned, was when the, when the Nile was turned to blood. Do you know they worshiped the Nile as a, like a deity? And it was literally like a slap in their face. God could have done it, and he did a lot of other things, didn't he? But of all the things that he did, he basically said, let me show you who the real God is. Let me show you that that's not a real God out there, but I'll tell you who is. And, of course, he showed himself over and over and over, and we know the stories about Pharaoh would say, okay, you can go. No, I'm not going to let you go. But what about Elijah on Mount Carmel? First uh, 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 Kings 18, Elijah didn't believe in Baal. But he gave the prophets an opportunity, and of course, that's one of the great stories, and it's so fun to preach, and I'm not going to do that tonight. You can look it up for yourself. He just had a field day with those poor guys. He said, hey, if your God can't hear you, you might want to yell. Maybe he's sleeping, you know. He's just having fun with this. You go ahead with that Baal thing. I know who the real God is, and of course, God showed himself in a big way as he licked up all that sacrifice, no matter how much it was drenched. And so, so I just want you to see, yeah. People will believe in other gods, but there is only one God, and we see his greatness in that. Number two, verse nine, we see not just God among, but we see God above. Look at verse nine again. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Stop for a moment. Has this happened yet? All the nations are bowing to God right now? I want you to wrap your mind around what that's going to look like, though. Now, I got excited when I was studying this. Because right now, there's a lot of people that will, will say ridiculous things like, if there's a God out there, even though creation shows us clearly that there is, and, and people have these whimsical, half-hearted prayers and mindsets, David gives it right where it belongs. All nations, he makes this declaration all people groups who now has made God as creator shall come and worship before thee. They're not just going to stand before God, but they're going to kneel before God. They're going to worship him. Now, it's going to be too late for a lot of them. But then all these people groups will come. I want to make sure you understand something. The one thing that God wants above everything else from us is our worship. By the way, if you don't know this, so does the devil. 
That's why he wars with us for our hearts and tries to pull on us away from the things where God would have our allegiance and our devotion and worship. And so he'll bring things in front of us and try to distract us and things. But I want you to think for a moment. When you think about all nations, I want you to think about what this looks like because we're, we're, we're Americanized here and we're, we're thinking about it. So it's easy to think, okay, wouldn't it be something if this were the case today in Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. is not all Christian, if you didn't know that. I hate to burst some bubbles. I know some of you are like, it's not. <laughs> I think you know better. Um, but wouldn't it be something if all of Washington, D.C. would bow and declare the one true God? What about Israel? Israel is far from God. That's why God's going to bring tribulation, in particular for the Israelites, but for everybody that's in the way of that that are not believers. In Palestine, Palestine. I said it Texas style, didn't I? Palestine. Palestine is what they say over there. So in Palestine, would it, will they all bow one day? Well, the Bible says so. What about in New Delhi? I got the chance to talk to a man at the state meeting last week, uh, Brother Singh, S-I-N-G-H. Um, and he told me about the work that God's doing in North India where there's very few people. Most of the Christianity is in the South. He's up North. It's a different world. But I wish I had this verse in mind when I was talking to him because I'd love to have talked to him and say, you know, one day God's going to work through this. What about in Beijing and China where they don't even think about God mostly? Uh, in Moscow, where uh, actually outside of D.C., that's the second most religious place. So I'm going to list it, but it's still less than 50% there. In Tehran, in, in Iran, and, and you think about these places that are so eaten up with hate towards Christianity. And like I said, outside of Washington, D.C. and Moscow, the countries and capitals that I mentioned all have less than 2% Christian representation. You realize that these other places are 98% anti-God. Wrap your mind around. India and China are two of the largest countries in the world. And over 98% of the people. But the Bible tells us it's going to be different here soon, isn't it? All nations. Doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your religious pre preference. God's going to bring it all together. And yet, God and His sovereignty. I want you to think about that for a moment, because I know what I I know how I would feel. You mean you're not going to give me any time of day? You're not going to love me? You're not going to care for me? I, I do all these things for you? Why would God create people that don't want that? That's why I always want to have a discussion with a Calvinist. Calvinists, if you don't understand when I say that term, basically they believe in a different term of predestination. The Bible talks about predestination, and I'm not against it. I'm not against foreknowledge. They're all good biblical terms. It's what we do with them. And basically, a lot of people will go to irresistible grace. They go to the tulip doctrine, and, and, and you're, you're, you know, you're going to get saved whether you like it or not. And God picks and chooses. That's not in the Bible. That's wrong. Uh, it really takes away from these passages right here. And what we're talking about. But why would God make a people that are never going to come to him? Matter of fact, you know most of the world will not come to God. And yet he created us. I think it just shows you how incredibly loving. Because when he says, I want everyone to come, he gives free will. That's a great term. It's in the Bible. It's not listed as such, but it's free will. He gives you grace and abundance to know there is a Savior. Even nature declares the handiwork of God. So he gives every evidence that there is holy God if you will call upon him as your Savior. So everyone that will come can come and know Christ. God is truly above. But one day, there will be no Muslim. There will be no Hindu. There will be no Buddhist. And guess what? There will be no Jewish. There will only be Jesus and all those who will follow him. Then we see verse 10. God alone. So we have God above, we have God among, and then we have God alone. For thou art great. I'm just, that's why I said the first point is the greatness of God. I'm just telling you exactly what the Bible says. And dost wondrous things. Thou art God alone. What David is trying to say in his prayer of praise to him is, A, you have no equal, of course, but B, it's because there's no one else. I want you to think about what we do with um, this deist mindset that we have in our culture. Do we not make gods out of things and people primarily? 
we, we, we worship people. I really don't want to venture into this, but I'm going to venture into this, and I hope none of you fire me for what I'm about to say, but I'm going to just be honest. I'm concerned about a portion of our country that worships Donald Trump right now. You realize he's a man, right? Fallible, just as any other politician. <laughs> he's certainly shown his faults. And I can't understand how we worship a politician. We, we, we worship there are political figures all across the world that have been and still are. And I'm not saying that it, you know, we can have a private conversation on my pros and cons about former President Trump, but that's not the point tonight. What I do think is happening is people will literally elevate a man to a point where they make him like God. And David says, stop before you even get there. Athletes, oh my goodness, do we worship athletes. And I love sports, and you have to be careful about how far you go with this. How do you know you worship them? Well, I get a lot more excited sometimes about my favorite team than I do about Jesus. That's not healthy. I mean, just because the Cowboys beat, what well, they beat the Giants the other week. I don't even know who they beat this week. But, you know, and they're playing Thanksgiving. They always play Thanksgiving. But, and I know I'm stepping on toes there, too, because I brought up the Cowboys. I'm sorry. But, but, you know, it's ridiculous how much we worship people. The psalmist makes it very clear here. God, you're, you're God alone. Let me move on, because I want to get you all involved in this. Secondly, I want you to see the goodness of God towards us. Because not just is God good, and not just the fact that he sees down, he sees pizza center, he sees other people are sinners, and he says, you know what? I don't care how bad you are, how bad you are. And let's be honest, none of us are as good as we probably think we are. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you a lot of scripture that says this. And I'm not trying to be hateful. I'm just trying to be honest. God still says, I love you like crazy, and I'm going to pour all my favor into you. No, and no parent does that, by the way. That's how you raise brats, okay? <laughs> I'm going to give you whatever you want. And God doesn't give us everything he wants, but he gives us a lot of things that we don't deserve. Maybe that's the better term, right? And most parents wouldn't do that, but yet that's our loving Heavenly Father. The goodness of God towards us. I want to back up. I gave you the preface of verses 8 through 10. To give you context, let's back up to verse 1. And I want you to see some things. I listed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 things that God does in these uh, 7 verses. Ready? Bow down thine ear, verse 1. O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. It's literally this, um, I'll give you a $20 word, anthropomorphic picture. It's the way we try to visualize God. And the psalmist David here kind of has this image of a man and God who would literally humanly bend over like I do sometimes with my wife because she, she for whatever reason, I'm around this corner and she thinks I can hear her. A, you know what happens? I'm going to help the women out here because some of y'all women don't know this and you get mad at your husbands. You know we're men, first of all, and there's this thing called husband selective hearing, right? So we're, we're defective. That was, I think it happened in the garden. So I just want to, did y'all get that at Home Builders? If not, I was going to call those guys, help them out, okay? I'm trying to be funny here. You know it's not real, but we do this a lot. I didn't hear what you said, honey. I could hear everything else. It's just the way it works. And I literally cannot hear my wife, and she gets so mad about it. I said, I, I'm trying, honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens sometimes. But God listens. I'm so glad that God's such a good listener. He listens to me gripe and complain and mully grub. And, and the psalmist here, he says, hear me, I'm poor and needy. I'm going to say this. I have a hard time believing that David, now we know that in our study of David, we know sometimes he had to go steal some bread from the, from the uh, tabernacle because he was so hungry. So there was times that he lacked. But when we think of poor and needy, we're thinking about a different situation. David probably for most of his life was not literally that, but he had needs, no doubt, like everybody does. But he, you see this picture, and I almost think to myself, okay, God's listening to a person probably gripe and complain more than they really are having it bad as they think. And yet, he sees our needs. And in verse 6 also brings this into play. Give ear, so there we see it again. O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplication. That's my pleading I'm pleading. He's not just asking. He's begging God because he's that um, in need. And so God listens. God listens. And that's wonderful to know because some of us, maybe all of us, 
are going to need to be reminded of this right now or maybe in the near future. And I'm glad we have such a great listener in our Heavenly Father. Secondly, verse 2, we see that God preserves. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. Okay, this isn't talking about uh, losing your salvation. What, he's going through a pit right now in life. He's going through a steep valley, and he needs God's hedge about him, as we would say probably in our terms today. That protective boundary, that buffer to give me strength. I need a, I need a break. And the, the preserve has the idea of protection. From, from those things that are without, but I also believe it's protection from our own selves, too. Because we can be our own worst enemy sometimes. So preserve my soul, for I am holy. He said, I'm a believer. I'm trying to follow you. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. So he, he is the one who created us. He, we already seen a couple times where he said he made. So we know he's creator. And he doesn't stop. I mean, think about something that you spend a lot of time and energy in. Maybe, it's a, maybe you rebuild a car, and you put a lot of time into that car. That's your baby. It's probably not sitting out in the elements. It's probably in that garage. It may have a tarp over it. You take extra care of it because you basically had a part in recreating maybe instead of creating. But nonetheless, you had a part in where it's at today. And that's just one illustration. I don't know what it might be in your life, but you're going to take extra care. Why would God put so much energy and effort? And by the way, none of us are the same. I said that the other day, and I'm going to remind you again. None of us are the same. Nobody's identical. Every one of us are special to God. He formed us. He didn't put us on a conveyor belt and just, boing, 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 and here we are, mass produce. It's not the way he does it. Every one of us are individual in our own way, and God created us this way, and he's going to take care of that, and he preserves us. He preserves it from, the, from without and from within. So thirdly, or secondly, we see God preserves. Thirdly, in verse 3, we see God is merciful. What a beautiful word. What a beautiful word. God is merciful. His abundant love. That's the picture here. To be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. He's, he's struggling. And David knows whom to go to in his struggles. Where can I go but to the Lord? I mean, it's a song that resonates in my mind. Um, David knows who will supply what is needed most, and he knows whom to go to. It'd be a crying shame to, to pull up at a tire shop and think I'm going to have brain surgery there. That, that'd be foolish. But God's all in one. He knows how to handle every one of our circumstances. I don't go to a, my endocrinologist and, and, and talk to them like they're my podiatrist. I mean, they, don't, they specialize in different areas of the body. So, you, you, you know, but God is all in one, and he knows whom he can go to. Fourthly, I love this one. Rejoice. Rejoice. What does rejoice mean? Glad? Be happy? Is it okay to rejoice? We're good at the other stuff. We, we're really good about telling everybody. about telling, But you know, God wants to hear us talk about him. He wants us to brag on God. You know, a lot of times, I'm really shredding on thin ice tonight, aren't I? Um, a lot of times when we pray, you know how we pray. God, give me this. God, give me this. God, give, do you, What about bragging on God? Wouldn't it be great if we just prayed one time and then say, God, by the way, while you're at it, give me this. And he, it's okay. He doesn't mind. Wouldn't it be great if we spent like 20 minutes or a half hour and just said, God, you're awesome. God, thank you for doing this. God, I know my toe, toe got hurt today, but look, my foot still works. It could be worse. God, I know. And we just take every circumstance and just go, boom, God, you're awesome. Let's just rejoice. Yeah, I got a headache, but you know what? I got some ibuprofen that will knock it out here soon. I'm okay. I'm okay. You know? I mean, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I found somebody, thank you, Greg, that let me know Mondays are pretty good rejoicing days too, right? So... I mean, whatever you're rejoicing is, you're allowed to rejoice. The Bible says it's okay. Can it be okay if we rejoice? I, I don't know if I need to ask your permission, but I'm going to ask anyway. Okay, I just want to make sure. Because I know we're scared sometimes. People don't think you're insane because you start bragging on Jesus a little bit like you're nuts. Well, we don't do that. We're real religious. Well, maybe we need to quit being religious and we still need to start rejoicing instead. I think they go hand in hand if you look at the Bible and see what it says, all right? I'll quit meddling, but what I wanted you to see in verse 4 is that God uplifts. There's nothing. Poor Austin and all the guys that do music, 
just, I know what it's like to preach. But these guys get up there and let's sing. And you say, he's made me glad. He's made me glad. I will rejoice because he's made me glad. And people just, you know what I'm saying? And then we sing it like we just had a root canal <laughs> without Novocaine or whatever, you know? God uplifts, y'all. I mean, don't be scared, okay? He, he's in his spiritual forklifts, okay? So let's give him praise. Number, number uh, one, two, three, four, five. I love this one. Verse, verse five, for thou, Lord, art good. Well, I said the goodness of God towards us and ready to forgive. Man, I'm so glad God forgives me for all the stupid bonehead, nincompoop, whatever words I can use on a Wednesday night and get away with. Don't we do, don't, I mean, don't, God is so good to us, and why do I squander it, and why do I act the way I do? Why do I get road rage? Did anybody else here besides me get a little road rage every once in a while? Did you raise your hand, Kay? Guys, we'll make sure. Right, Eddie, you don't get road rage. Everybody else around you might, but it's not your fault, right? I know one guy back in Washington Parish in Louisiana, and he drove 20 miles an hour. He never had a problem with road rage, but he caused a lot of us to have it. It's just frustrating. Dude, you got an accelerator. You see the speed limit. What are we doing here, you know? It just would constantly drive. I'm like, Pete, don't get in a hurry. God's got a reason, you know? God, forgive me. I'm going to invoke verse, verse 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. It's like he's on go. You know, you know, I read this, and I hate to say it. I'm just going to be honest, Miss Eva. He's probably ready to forgive because he knew he was going to make Pete Underwood, and he's always got to be ready to forgive me because I'm going to mess up a couple times. And you don't know when it's going to happen. But that's not just Pete. That's all of us. I mean, Stephanie and the kids always behave. They never frustrate you. We're not even going to bring up Jody, right? We'll just leave him out of this conversation. So, But, you know, this is what happens. God says, hey, God, give me patience, okay? And he says, I, you know what comes with that tribulation, i.e., here's your kids, right? You know, so anyway, no, kids are wonderful most of the time. And so, but God forgives us. And we fail all the time. And he's so faithful to forgive us. And he's so ready to forgive. He's like, just ask, and I'm ready to give it. It's like, I've got this ready for you with your name on it. Just come and receive my forgiveness. I'm so thankful for God's long suffering and his great mercy and his forgiveness because they all bundle together in this. And then we already read verse six. So verse seven tells us that God answers. Man, I'm glad we don't have to deal with a God where I got to talk to a computer all the time. Push one, push five, push eight. Wait for me 20 minutes later. Oh, sorry, it hung up. Do it all over again. It's so frustrating. And whoever created that thing they either need to get forgiveness or we need to have a conversation because I know they expedite businesses. Do you know, true story, I'm not going to mention this person's name because somebody in Bogalusa might be watching and they'll bring it up. So while I was pastoring there, we did a church directory. And I know we've done that here. And so typically when you have a church directory, some ways you can remind people. So we're going to call the Thompsons and so Wayne and Ramona and they'll get an automated voice message. So I don't know if we've done that here before or not, if that's the way it's worked. But anyway, just want to remind you, Wayne, Ramona, y'all got an appointment at 2.30 on Tuesday. Hope to see you here. And so they said, well, you're the pastor. Let's use your voice. I said, that's fine. So I did it. And I got somebody mad at me because they said, I don't want to hear an answer machine. I want to hear you personally. Well, that's good, except for you better have about three days that week to just cut out your schedule because there's a lot of people in church, and they want me to have a call. So that was a little bit ridiculous, that person had that kind of demand. But they were that sick of voicemail, is what it was. And, and we were fine. I went and had a conversation because I heard about it. You know how church members don't grumble behind the pastor's back and don't tell them why they're mad. I mean, I know y'all not like that. So anyway, but I'm just glad when we say, God, I need you, there's no like, hey, hold on, line one. There's no none of this. It's like immediate line. Three in the morning, immediate line. Doesn't matter what time of day or night, there's God. I'm not really doing good right now. I haven't been with you lately, God. And you know, here's the cool thing about it. This person hasn't been in church in 25 years. They show up on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night, and they say, God, I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. And if they, haven't got, they haven't talked to God in 25 years. Or maybe they did. The only time they ever talked to him was, hey, God, bail me out. I'm in jail. Or, hey, God, I'm my, somebody's in, in the hospital, and I really could use a, a big one here. You know, they're just basically saying, God, think about me. and don't care about nobody else. But that person can walk in in that condition, cry to God, and you know what the Bible says? He's ready to forgive, and he picks up right away. Tell me anybody you know that would do that to anybody else if I just did that to you. I, I'm, not, I'm trying not to be unspiritual, but I'm just going to be honest. You do me dirty like that, I'm not sure I'm going to pick up the phone if I see your name on the call. Right? You probably wouldn't pick it up if it was me, same way. 
But that's our God. He is so good to us, and we are so unworthy. And David says, I got confidence in my God. I don't have to worry, hope, maybe he's going to get it. I know he's going to get it. I know it's going to work. And that's what's so great about God. We see his goodness. Let me move, and then I want to get you all involved. In conclusion, the first American Thanksgiving is often dated 1621. We know the story of the, the, the Native Americans and the, and the pilgrims getting together. Those poor pilgrims didn't know a lick about farming, and those Native Americans came along and helped them out and showed them about some things, and they were able to get through that, that next time around because that first time around was rough. And Anyway, but really and truthfully, if you do some deep dive in American history, you find out that 11 years earlier, we had this place called Jamestown. Okay? Jamestown was very tough and didn't really cut it. But nonetheless, in 1610, the settlers were really in a bad way. Had about 409 people, and now they went down to 60 before they knew it because they couldn't hang in there. and People were dying left and right. The survivors didn't know what to do. But they prayed. They prayed for help without knowing when or even if help would arrive. But when help arrived in the form of this ship, can you imagine being those people struggling, barely hanging on, and off the shore you see this ship coming in? You want to talk about excitement and hope? And, and they were so excited. This ship comes in, it's filled with food and needed supplies from England. You know the first response? They had Thanksgiving. No, it wasn't over a turkey, and it wasn't over all that. They had a Thanksgiving of prayer and praise. It was held so they could give thanks to God for his answer and his provisions. That's what we're to do. A lot of times we associate the word Thanksgiving with a meal. It's celebrating God. It's telling God, thank you, I love you, and I want to praise you. So tonight... We're going to close momentarily. We're not going to do it with an invitation like we normally do. We'll have a special prayer to wrap it up. But I'd like to give you an opportunity to just say thank you, God, to rejoice. We've got some microphones so that everybody can hear. And I'd like for you, if you'd like to, to just raise your hand. We're not here to embarrass you. We're not here to make you. If anybody wants to just say, I want to share something really good that God's doing in my life, or I want to share something God did once in my life. Now, we don't have all night. So we want to give everybody opportunity, but if you'd like to say something, the floor would be yours. Uh, Brother Austin would be glad to get the microphone to you. Would somebody like to share a testimony of praise tonight? Now, after I just preached that, surely at least one of y'all got something exciting to share, right? Brother Eddie? I just want to thank God for blessing us and being good to us. He is a good, great God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for saying that, Brother Eddie. Someone else tonight? I just want to say thank you to God for um, allowing me to do uh, ladies' ministry. It's just, it's been a huge blessing to me just to get to uh, love on these other ladies and us grow closer to Christ through studying His Word. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Someone else just want to share a blessing? Ooh, I've never talked into a mic before. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be but all right. I thank God for this church. Y'all have just opened your arms to me, and the, the Lord has just been working. And I have never, I sat last night and I thought, this is the sixth, I'm 75, so this is the sixth church I've been in all my life. I've never seen a church put back into the congregation like Landmark. And I just love it here. So y'all are Y'all are stuck with me forever. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad for that, too. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else want to share a blessing tonight? Going once. Going twice, Miss Stephanie. Yeah, you, it's okay. Um, I am very thankful for my husband. <laughs> He, she um, was fixing to say that, Jody. Don't steal it now. Hey, that's what happens when you do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what you got, Miss Stephanie? Um, I'm very thankful for God's long suffering. Mm -hmm. He's been so long suffering with me, but we're kind of in this period right now with Charlotte where she's not sure if she's saved. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm so thankful for God's long suffering with her and how he allows daily conversations to come up that we can have conversations just with her about the scriptures and about salvation. And it, it even happened today in the car. And I'm just thankful wow. for that. Amen. And while you're all listening, just keep praying for her. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. And we certainly will. Somebody else? Ms. Ramona? I want to say thank you to the church. When we came here, we were pretty broken, and y'all showed us so much love, and we could feel the Holy Spirit as soon as we came through the doors. And I just want to thank each and every one for y'all's love that y'all shown us Amen. and for welcoming us in to your group. Amen. We're glad to have you, too. For y'all that may not have been here Sunday night, uh, the Thompsons came and moved their membership to be a part of our church family, so we rejoice in that. Anybody else want to share? Okay. Thank you, Brother Austin. I appreciate it. And I appreciate y'all. And I know every one of you have a, a good song in your heart. I just want to give you opportunity to give God praise when the moment arises. So with that understanding in mind, I want to have a special time of prayer tonight. I just want to let God, I just want us to come together. So I, don't, I want to do this a little different if we can. I don't want to ask everybody, because standing may be a little more challenging for some than others, but I just want this to be a special time. And this is going to be our closing prayer. But I just want this to be a special time. Let's do it this way. Let's take a couple moments just where it's quiet and you and God talk. I'm not asking you to fan out. We're not doing that prayer tonight. But I'm just going to ask you to just bow your heads for some silent meditation. And maybe you just tell God, I want to list at least five things, God. You're good. And we'll give it about a minute or so. And then we'll have our closing prayer. And I'm going to ask Brother Mike Cockroft to do that. When, Brother Mike, if you would, just give us about a minute. Well, we can all just tell God how amazingly good he is. And then while he's praying, you can keep on going because I'm sure God would love to hear from us. So let's bow our heads at this time. And then, Brother Mike, if you would, after about a minute or so, close us out in prayer and praise, okay?